Um, oh, goodness. So I'm going to quickly introduce myself, Dr. Mancho. I go by Ibn Salim Mancho. My background is uh, I'm, uh, I'm boarded in general surgery. So I did general surgery for six, five years. I worked as a surgeon for a while. And then I went into plastics, and for good reason. And then I did <clears throat> plastics for three years, and then I decided that three years wasn't good enough. So then I did an extra year of pediatric craniofacial. So that is my background, I'm making a nutshell. So today, my goal is to give you guys an idea of what plastic surgery is to me, and, and for most plastic surgeons, right? Because sometimes plastic surgery gets a bad rap as being just the, you know, big breasts, big boobs, and things like that, all the aesthetic sides of things. But w the majority of what we do uh, is, is quite involved, and, uh, and, and I think that's what drove me to, to want to be a plastic surgeon. And I can just advance with this. So <clears throat> I was trying to find a quote that sort of reflects truly what we, we do as plastic surgeons. And, and this was one that came pretty close. I wasn't smart enough to come up with my, with my own, of course. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it pretty much says that um, uh, if you change defect on someone's face, you can affect the soul. And uh, as plastic uh, as surgeons, really, our goal is threefold. So one, we try to restore things to close to their, their normal shape, you know, the anatomical shape as possible, uh, their original form. Um, we try to make things work the way they were intended to work. And then, of course, the aesthetic part of the plastics, we try to make it look good. Everybody likes something that looks, looks good. So. Um, so today's objectives, we'll be quickly talk about what it takes to be a plastic surgeon and stay uh, and be a good, productive plastic surgeon. We'll look at how diverse the field of plastic surgery is, because it is really a diverse field. Um, explore the world of pediatric plastics and uh, craniofacial surgery, which is something true and dear to me. Um, um, and then, of course, for anyone that is thinking about having aesthetic surgeries, just some, a few tips on some of the safe, some of, some safe, safety things that you can do to ensure that when you do aesthetic surgery, you get the desired, or any surgery, you get the desired outcome. So what is the road to becoming a plastic surgeon? You can do it straight out of medical school, which would take you six years, or you can do it the way I sort of do, did it. You can do something else, some surgical subspecialty, whether it, whether it be general surgery, orthopedic surgery, neurosurgery, uro, urology, or ENT. And then after that, three years, so that is at least five, anywhere from five to seven years once you go that route and then an additional three years to become a plastic surgeon. And then, if you've, you're done becoming a plastic surgeon, you decide, like me, that <clears throat> you need more training in something, or there's something that really piques your interest. You can go on to do microsurgery, uh, you can do you know, pediatric plastics and cranial maxillofacial surgery, which is you know, what I did. You can spend time doing hand surgery and do complex hand, uh, work, um, you can do burns, and then you can do aesthetics. So what does it take to be a, a plastic surgeon? Once you're done with your plastic surgery training, you take a written exam, and then when you pass the written exam, you take an oral examination. And then once you've passed both of that, then you get boarded as a plastic surgeon. And then every seven to 10 years, there is, you're required to do CMEs to, keep, to ensure that you are practicing safe medicine. And uh, if you take a look at this chart, it pretty much tells you what plastics and reconstructive surgery is all about. And, and if you can see, only a piece of that pie deals with aesthetics. The rest of it deals with reconstructive. So a bulk of what we do, I even though we do a lot of aesthetics, our training emphasizes the reconstructive. So who knows what this insignia represents? The, uh, 
Mm -hmm. You don't know? I was in the Marine Corps. We just blow things up and kill people. Sorry. <laughs> 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 we don't fix things. You don't we fix things. The but that. you have the Navy. So <laughs> this insignia sure. is the insignia of a Navy SEAL. And uh, the reason it's up there and I find it interesting is because if you think of uh, what Navy SEALs, what they're trained to do is they're trained to go into any environment and deal with all situations that come up. And when I, <laughs> when I was reading, you know, with, with the recent Navy SEAL-like movies out, and I took a fascination to that, and I'm like, that is almost sort of like what I do because our training allows us to reconstruct any part of the body from head to toe. And hopefully today with some of the, the things we go through, I would give you an example of how we, we work with neurosurgeons or open heart surgeons or urologists or BGYNs to reconstruct difficult problems that they cannot reconstruct. So that's why this is up here. So we go everywhere. So, <clears throat> So in order to dive, so this is, this is the part where I, but I got to warn anyone, if you've not, if you're done eating, that's good. If you have a queasy stomach, you may want to take some anti-nausea medication or step out because some of the pictures are not all pretty, okay? Actually, most of them are not all pretty. But to me, when they're, when they're pretty. The only disclaimer I have is I'm an assistant professor. I work for a I work for a university, and uh, everything you're going to see is my, it's my work. It's not borrowed work. So I speak from my viewpoint and from my, from my, my experience. So we'll start with trauma and reconstruction, right? So uh, I'm going to show you guys some of, some of the trauma and reconstructive things we, we deal with. Once again, we're gonna, I'm going to show you guys that as plastic surgeons, we invade every part of the body. So this is a CAT scan of a patient that was involved in a horrific motor vehicle I mean, collision, right? So that's, that's what it looked like, I mean, initially. And, and, and on average, plastic surgeons that deal with uh, head and neck trauma or maxillofacial trauma, this is not an uncommon thing to uh, a common situation to encounter. So these are pictures. And what you see here is, uh, let me see, point out. Those are some of those fragments of bones. And then this is fragments of bone you over the, the skull that we, 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 once again, try to restore to some sort of normalcy. And then this is what we look like initially. Not pretty, of course, but at least everything is there and working. And this is what the CAT scan looks like once you have all those plates and screws in your face, right? So a lot of them, a lot of them, okay? And you can step and ask questions. So like I said, we are, this is supposed to be very interactive. And then no, on that, this is... Yes, go ahead. Everything heal over that, with any of that, is that all permanent? Nothing there is going to go away or melt in or disappear? Everything that was reconstructed is all the hardware? Yes, the hardware is permanent. No. Yes, the hardware is permanent. So the only time the hardware comes out is if, we, if, you, if there's issues with the hardware. Let's say there's infection that compromises the hardware. But the hardware is, 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 is safe. Um, um, it's safe to be in there for a very long time. Okay? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Is most of it titanium? Yes, some of it is. Yeah, most of it is titanium. Yes. Okay. But, but, but not all of it. So, so it depends on on, on the, the who makes the instrumentation, so it varies. So yes, some of it is titanium. Because sometimes if you're allergic to nickel and titanium, you could run into a problem, but I think it's only if it's exposed like a rod going through, through. in one way or the other. Right, and... and, and Is it a martini question that they ask that way? Oh, so, so, okay, I see. So the question is, is the... Hardware, titanium. For the most part, it is titanium. 
but some of the hardware can be stainless steel. And again, it, it comes down to who makes the plating system and, and, and what they use. But you can, you can get hardware that if you have a specific allergy, we can, we can treat you without exposing you to that type of a metal. Okay. Which is why it's important. In, in your wallet, you should have a card that says what your allergies are. Because when you come, come in in that situation, no one knows what your, your allergies are. So uh, our priorities are to sort of try to stabilize and get things done. So we use what is readily available. But if you have a way to notify us that, hey, this is what my allergies are, then we can always definitely make proper arrangements to make sure that you're not exposed to that. How do you control infection? It just seems like there's so many opportunities here that it would be almost like an impossible. <laughs> yes, you're right. So the question is, how do you control infection? And you, you control infection by one, at the time of surgery, cleaning that out as much as possible, right? So they say the, the solution to pollution is dilution, right? So it's, most times when it's like that, it's infected, so you try to dilute a lot of that pollutant that is in there as much as possible. And then, once you're done, you put them on anti-antibiotics, right, to, to sort of control for that. Okay? I have a question. Yes. You said in your billfold, if you're in a car accident type of thing and everything's like totally going every which way, where are the most likely places to have your information? I always heard keep it in your glove box. Um, or a refrigerator if you're at home type of thing. Those are the places that the uh, people that are coming in to help you, they look for in those areas for your information. Right, uh, and, I, and I, I would say that the safest place to have information pertaining to your health, just have it. Because most times the first responders, my, my, my understanding is when they come, the first responders, they search through the scene. They try to collect as much information as possible. So if you have it on you someplace, it will make its way to the, to, to the secondary I mean, responders, which will be the people yeah, at the hospital. Okay. Now, this case is a uh, young patient that um, um, first had a gunshot wound to the leg, if I'm not mistaken, then had, uh, uh, and, and the orthopods uh, for close to 12 months, uh, whoa, did a phenomenal job saving the leg. But, let me see, what's my pointer? He ended up with, this is exposed, not only bone, but bone substitute. So. He had a hard time making bone because the gap was so, so big. They used bone substitute to bridge some of the missing bone. So we were tasked with trying to cover that hole. You're like, that's a small hole. Why can't you just move the skin and close it? Well, the trouble is all the skin from the multiple surgeries and the trauma so scarred down, nothing moves. So... To preserve his limb, we came up with a very smart way to do that. So we took tissue with blood supply from the arm. So we sacrificed one of the blood, blood vessels to the hand, right? So good thing we have two or more. So we could sacrifice one. So we sacrificed one, and we plugged it into his left leg to get blood flow so that we could use that tissue to cover the hole in his right leg. And we kept him pinned like that for close to 21 days. Okay. So, I mean, again, challenging cases, but we find, come up with solutions to try to, to take care of the problem. So what about wounds from radiation cathar cancer? Well, one of the biggest things, one of the, as she says, when you look at cancer treatment, radiation therapy is, is phenomenal. There's this uh, saying that you can treat anything if you radiate it enough. And that is true. The trouble with radiation is it doesn't know 
when to kill cancer cells and save non-cancer cells. It obliterates everything. So but the good thing with radiation is that it would treat the cancer. The bad thing is that you would have collateral damage to the healthy skin. And that becomes an issue because an issue in wounds, you have a hard time healing radiated wounds. So a lot of the a lot of the things we do, a fair amount of the things we do major reconstructive surgery for are actually wounds that have been radiated. And this is a patient that had brain cancer surgery. They took out part of the, the bone, the uh, temporal, I mean parietal bone, and then they put in a metal plate. And he got radiation. It took care of the cancer, but the wound did not heal. And they tried cutting that and closing it, and it still wouldn't heal. Once again, the radiation effect. So what we did was, just like the picture prior, we took blood vessel and skin from his forearm, plugged it into his neck, and resurfaced that wound. The wound was closed, and he's back to life as normal. And a similar type problem, brain tumor, they did a biopsy, they radiated the cancer, it responded well to radiation and chemotherapy. However, the biopsy incision did not heal because of the radiation. What we did was we took skin, muscle, and fat from the back, moved it up to close that hole. Yeah. This is a patient that had cancer of the mouth. They treated the cancer with radiation. He did great for about two, three years. He went and got a dental procedure done and ended up with a dry socket. And the dry socket turned into an infection that did not heal. And he had chronic pain for chronic pain and ongoing decay of the left jaw. So what we did was we took out the whole entire left jaw that was radiated and pretty much dead. We took bone from his leg with the blood vessel. Right, so this is, you can see the bone here, the skin paddle from his leg. We connected it, so he, in this picture, this is the bone from his foot, or from his leg, I should say, is used to bridge the gap. The blood vessel is connected to a blood vessel in the neck, and this is him. I like that response. I thought people only said wow to cosmetic. <laughs> it's great that I'm hearing wow to the reconstructive aspect of, of what we do. So that's good. The, the cancer uh, was caused by the dry socket, not? No, he had cancer before. The dry socket was caused by, so for people that have had radiation for cancer of the mouth around the jaw area, when you go to have a tooth pull or once you pull that tooth, you got to put something in the socket. Most times, you got to take healthy bone marrow, for lack of a, a lack of a better word. You got to take healthy bone marrow from the hip or someplace else and put it in that socket. If not, you end up with a dry socket, because once again, the radiation has destroyed the marrow. If we go back here, if you see this, this is all dis destruction right, within the marrow of the jawbone from the radiation. Once again, the radiation worked beautifully. It took care of the cancer. He didn't have to have surgery for his cancer, which was great. But once they pulled his tooth, they left him with a dry socket that got infected. Now the infection caused the problem. So he came to see me not because of the cancer. He came to see me because of the infection. Yes. Got a question about that. Yes, ma'am. Now, if you have artificial knees, okay. before you go and have 
any dental work at all done, mm -hmm. you have to take four amoxicillin before you even go to the dentist. Then he works on you and you take another amoxicillin when you're done. Right. Had, you know, hindsight's always 2020, but had they thought about trying to avoid the infection, if he would have taken amoxicillin, would that have played any role? Because a lot of people get a dry socket, especially if you have your top teeth up. Right, but a lot of people get a dry socket, they haven't had radiation. So the problem is not, even with the amoxicillin, if you, if you, if you don't fill, it, fill that hole and get it to heal as quickly as possible, you can end up with an infection. Because you're, you're taking the amoxicillin just for the one day procedure, make sense? Right, so like with, you've had both knees done, you've got to have dental work. You're taking the amoxicillin just once. You, you're not taking the amoxicillin for a week or two weeks. So the amoxicillin doesn't last two months, even just because you, you take it once. So, so I, and my understanding and my thought process is with the issue like this, could the amoxicillin help? Yes. Maybe, as you said, yes, maybe. But the biggest deal is for the dental issue, you gotta, you have to make sure that the socket is, is, is closed. And most times you wanna use vascular healthy bone that has, still has cells in there that can make good bone, mm -hmm. right? So you gotta go someplace that has not been radiated, get healthy bone marrow, for lack of a better word, and put it in that and try to close that space as best as you can to sort of prevent issues like this. Okay. Question. Um, you had just said that you know you have to go get the healthy bone and close that. Yeah. Had, is that something that they should have done as part of the dental procedure? Yeah. It seems expensive for dental. <laughs> <laughs> you see, it's, it's, uh, I, this is why I should Maybe this is, I should go back to my disclaimer slide. I mean, I'm not a dentist, so, so uh, and, and it would be wrong of me to, to generalize all, uh, all dentists out there because some of them, we all come from such diverse backgrounds, even dentists. There are some dentists that are comfortable taking out wisdom teeth. There are others that will not even touch it because their background is so, our background, our training is so diverse. So... So, and I'm, and I'm not sure if this was done and it just failed, and I'm not sure, but if you don't close that socket and get it to heal, this is what, is, this is what can happen. Yeah. And so this is him. So what about complex wound resulting from infection? Now, these are wounds that have not been radiated and they do happen. I mean, you don't need radiation to have wound problems. I have wound problems, and I, I try to think I'm a very, very good surgeon, and I have wound problems. So, I mean, you don't need radiation to have wound problems. There are other things that can that occur in and around a surgery uh, that can lead you to wound problems. So, the first one. This is a, a gentleman that had spine surgery done. And I'm not sure, that doesn't show so well, but that is hole in his back. You can see the rods and pins in his back. So he came to us because the wound wasn't closing. So what we did, you see this bulge here on the, right, on the corner? We took his part of his muscle, his back muscle, the lat, for those of you that lift weights, and we filled that defect and then we put a skin graft over it and it healed. So, he's not gonna swim like Michael Phelps because we borrowed that muscle, but he should be able to do anything else he wants. So this is a patient that had open heart surgery and ended up with wound healing issues. So now the chest is split back open and in here, I was trying to put a video. I'm not very tech savvy, but I was trying to put a video where you can actually see the, the beating heart. But I wasn't tech savvy, so. But underneath here it is the heart. On the screen. 
when you play the video, oh, it will. Okay. Ah, <laughs> ah. <laughs> so, what we did was took some of that beer belly. So we took some of the fat from the inside. I got a <laughs> <laughs> right? And used to cover that hole. And then brought the skin together and he's healed. How about reconstruction after cancer surgery? This is a gentleman with the diagnosis of melanoma. Right? So the surgical oncologist, they are awesome at making holes and taking out cancers. I, I, I shouldn't complain because I guess they keep me employed. <laughs> um, um, they're great at making holes and, and taking out cancers, and I've gotten good at closing them. So, so, so that's a good thing. Um, so most of the key structures in, in the neck are, are exposed. So we needed to take part of his chest muscle, right, the pec, and used it to fill, fill in that hole. And we took a piece of skin graft and put it over it. And this is how he looks right here in the middle. What happened? Oh, yeah, right here. Closed. Yes, sir. What's the time frame between the cancer surgery and the reconstruction? So, no, the cancer surgery and the reconstruction were? Together? Yeah, together. Okay. Yeah, together. And the skin graft here is <clears throat> close to six months out. So the final picture here is close to six months out. And how do you determine from where you're going to borrow? Exactly. So the... the Knowing where to borrow tissue, so determining where you're going to borrow tissue comes, one, from you having a conversation with your cancer doctor, so, which is, so we actually do talk. Physicians, we do pick up the phone and talk to one another, uh, surprisingly. We cannot write well, but we speak fairly well. Um, so we, 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 we have a conversation as to, what, his, what, what the plan is going to be, how big you think the, the defect is going to be. And then from that, you have a better idea where you need to go borrow tissue. Yes. <clears throat> a patient that had rectal cancer had radiation, and they took out the entire rectum. OK? So now he has a, a pouch, a permanent pouch. We had to fill in that hole. So we took tissue from skin, fat, and muscle from his thigh and closed up the hole with it. No, 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 no a reconstructive talk would be complete without talking about breast milk reconstruction. As plastic surgeons, we do a fair amount of that. I do a, a good amount. This is a lady. So on the top left, that is uh, a reconstruction, a final reconstruction before radiation. On the bottom right, that is what she looks like after radiation. So this is a patient that had breast cancer, had both breasts removed. We did implant-based reconstruction where we put tissue, we put balloons underneath the skin, stretch them out, and then put softer implants, for lack of a better word. And this is what she looks like. And she is deciding whether or not she wants us to create nipples for her or if she's just going to get them tattooed. This is a young lady uh, that did not have radiation, and she did not want nipple reconstruction because she is going to have 3D tattoo of her nipples. So, right. And this is a young lady. She's she had a mastectomy, had radiation to the right to, to, to the left side. You can see there's a stark difference between the skin quality on the left and the right. 
and she, after a year and a half, she decided that she wanted to have, she, she wanted to have breasts made for her. So we use tissue expanders to reconstruct the right breast, and we use her back muscle to reconstruct the left, and we made her nipples. So she wanted, when she made up her mind, she wanted everything done. So now we, now we're going to switch topics and move to a topic that is dear to me, and that is working with kids. Yeah, I, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a privilege, at least for me, I feel it's, it's so diff. It's, it's one thing when like an adult signs a consent and says, here, I want to have surgery. It's something else when they entrust their kids to you. And being a parent, I, I know how hard it is to entrust your kids to someone else. So that this, this to me is, is, is one of the highlights of the things I do. And as a craniofacial surgeon, so the things that I take care of, I take care of kids with, with few scars, so kids that are born. So a lot of things I take care of are congenital things and, of course, I mean, traumatic things. So kids that are born with misshaped heads, I help try to I mean, correct them to some degree. Take care of fractures to do some cleft lip and palate work. To do ear reconstruction, facial reanimation and pretty much any reconstructive effort that a, kid's, that a kid, kid needs. So the most common one we deal with during the summer, dog bites. Yes. Animal mutilation. So this is a kid that had almost the left cheek uh, uh, destroyed. That structure there is one of the nerves uh, supplying the lower eyelid. We were able to connect that back into the muscle and it functioned pretty well for the kid. So that was, that was pleasing. And one of, the things that, one, of the, one of the things I must say is that working with kids, they have an amazing ability to recover. So it's, 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 it's good to watch. So what are some of the congenital deformities I deal with? Ears. Well, this is the kid. The ears don't look all that normal. It's normal for the child, but for the rest of the public, for the rest of us, it might not be normal. And we were able to correct the ears without surgery, just by molding. At that age, they're so young, you can pretty much mold them. And the kid has, I think the kid has better ears than me. So, this is a uh, young kid that was being teased at school because of the shape of the ears, right? The ears stick out like antennas. Well, we did a little surgery, and now the kid is one of the bunch. And then what about kids that don't have ears? We make it for them. I mean, you can make it using cartilage, or you can use a prefabricated framework made out of, it's almost a silicone-based framework. And that's what the kit looks like. So. You use these printers now? No, I haven't gotten to using and, uh, the 3D printers, but, but the future is going to be uh, the 3D printing, right. So, so the way I practice now and the way I'm going to practice shortly, um, it's going to change drastically just, just because of the advances in medicine. The people, way, people out there that are way smarter than me that are doing some phenomenal things. So. And what material might be put through the 3D printing? Well, <clears throat> So truly, what the future, I think what the future is going to hold is you would be able to take, so you'll be able to take a framework that is going to make an ear, take chondrocytes, which are cells that make cartilage to the ear, you put it in this framework and grow it to be cartilage and then put it back in someone. So we're going to get to the point where we can take this kid's cartilage, the cells, 
put them in this framework, grow it, and then put it back in the kit so that the chances of are rejections next to nothing. Yeah, so that's, that is, that, that's, that's the future for what we do. So this is, uh, this is a kid with, one of the things I do, I'm not kids with abnormal premature fusion of the skull. So if you take a look at the top right hand corner, actually the top pictures, you can see that the right forehead is not round like the left. Yes. Right? It is not, actually all of the pictures, the right forehead is slanted. And the reason for this is the bones on the right side fused too early, right? So if you take a look at the skull, the skull has multiple open areas. And it's by design because as the brain grows, it allows those bones, it, it allows the brain to grow because then the brain shifts those bones. So uh, on this kit, the right side was closed, so then what tends to happen is you have growth only on one side. So the left side now looks abnormal, in addition to the right side looking abnormal. Is so, that a yes. Or is that something like you have four going together when you're born? No, and so. Then it, and then it takes so many months or weeks for that to get hard. No, so uh, the question is is that a birth defect? Uh, yes, um, um, uh, birth defect in the sense that most of these kids, when they are born, that's, that skull bone on that side starts to close too quickly. You see, most kids, when they are born, every kid may has a soft spot. If you really feel a young kid's head, right, the kid has soft spots that runs through the top, really from front to back, and from side to side. Those soft spots, they need to stay open to allow the brain to grow, right? So there are times where, or there are situations where those, the bones, they fuse too quickly. And then you have the head, the head is shaped abnormally. So what I mean, do we do for that? So we try to fix the problem or try to correct it. We may not fix the problem because we never quite fix the underlying cause. Because sometimes <laughs> we don't truly understand what the underlying cause is to be able to stop the underlying cause. But what we do is we try to fix the effects of the underlying cause. So we take off the frontal bone, the whole entire forehead. We take off the upper half of the eyes. and. We put it back together. And if you look at, I know this doesn't show too well, but if you look at the top right hand, you can see there's a significant amount of space between what is brain and what is the new bone, right? The significant amount of space. This is brain that ends here. This is the bone that is rounder now. And if you look at the forehead here, it's no longer flat on the right side. When's a surgery like that, what kind of time does it take to do something like that? <clears throat> So this surgery uh, typically runs anywhere from three to four hours. Uh, I, we in Dayton, we tend to do it, or I tend to do it in conjunction with the pediatric neurosurgeons. So it's, it's, it's a multi-team effort. It's not just the plastic surgeon, or it's not just the neurosurgeon, it's the team effort. Yes. So. And like I said, kids have an amazing ability to recover. They're in the hospital. Once the kid is able to open their eyes, they're good to go home. Yeah, so an average anywhere from, from three to four days maximum. So then I do a lot of cleft work. All right, so a typical kid with a complete clefting of the left lip and palate. This is what the repair looks like. This is the kid at almost a year plus. And then another kid with a bilateral cleft a deformity, surgeries, and then that's what they look like. So. I deal with v vascular lesions 
also known as birthmarks. Oh, yeah, that's a birthmark. Yes, and some of them are birthmark, and some of them don't cause problems. They just stay there. Some of them might be in places that are more noticeable, and no one likes that, and they, they, they can be in places that no one ever gets to see them, and it doesn't bother you. But some of them can cause problems, right? So top right-hand corner, that is a, a vascular lesion. That didn't quite go away. We, that was treated surgically. Top left, didn't, did nothing to that, and it is shrinking. So some of them will shrink on their own, okay? And this bottom right, I'm also watching that one, and it's, it is slowly shrinking. Now, this is a young, a young lady that had a vascular, a vena lymphomatic malformation of the tongue. She had been treated f I mean, for this problem before, non-surgically, so, and it came back with vengeance to the point where she could not put, keep her tongue in her mouth and she could not eat and she was losing weight. All right, so something had to be done. What did we do? We took out almost half of the tongue. That's what the surgery looks like. She can get her tongue like in her mouth now. She, she can feed appropriately. And uh, she's close to a, over a year removed from surgery, and she's doing great. So some of these problems can, some of these vascular lesions can pose a problem. Yes, young lady. Did she start out with like a normal size tongue that just overgrew or something? Yeah, so... Sometimes, I mean, some of these birthmarks, or as most people refer to them, depending on the type of vascular lesion you have, sometimes some of them would actually grow as the, the, the child grows. A vascular lesion, you mean that there's uh, blood flowing into it all? Right. So it could be arterial, it could be venous, it could be lymphomatic, sometimes a combination of those things. So, yes. For simplistic, simplicity, for simplicity I, I use the word vascular lesion not to bore you with the, the details of whether it's arterial, venous, or, uh, uh, or lymphatic, or capillary. So, but that's her. How old was she when you performed that? Uh, tw yeah, 12, 13, yeah. Close to being a teenager. Yeah. Do you know how old she was when that started? If I'm not mistaken, uh, I mean, I think they noticed the tongue getting bigger by age seven or so, and she had received uh, therapy for it, uh, which, which got it to shrink some, but then it, it started to grow back. Yeah. So one of the things that I do that I enjoy the most, and it's almost instant gratification. I guess that's, that's the mark of a surgeon, right, or a plastic surgeon, instant gratification. Well, so what I do on the right, on the appropriate child is I distract the jaw. By that, <laughs> what I mean by that is I actually break the jaw, I put in this appliance, and I actually moved the jaw forward. So this was a six-week-old kid that I was called to, to evaluate because the kid could not breathe, or the kid had troubles breathing laying flat. Every time the kid, they laid the child flat, the child would turn blue. The kid could only breathe upright or laying, laying on their tummy. So once we saw the kid and we evaluated the kid, we came to realize that the trouble with the kid was the chin was way too far back, but more importantly, the tongue. Because in kids, this young, they don't have the ability to move, the, get their tongue out of their mouth and pant, I mean like a dog, to breathe. So we had the option of either, the kid had the option of either having a trach or having the tongue 
sutured to the lip, right? To get the tongue out of the way, permanently like this, so that the kid could breathe laying flat, or have me break the jaw, put this modified car jack-like device, and literally crank it every day to move the jaw forward. And that's what we did. So bottom left, the jaw is broken. And it's not just broken anywhere, of course. It's broken too, not to injure the, the, the growth of the jaw. And then we place the device. And then you can see left, the, um, in the picture on the left, you can see the, the, the device hanging out. And at seven days, look at the position of the chin compared to where the chin was before. So this is what the chin is like. At seven days, look at the chin position. And at seven days, this kid is laying flat, and the kid is breathing like on its own. Both sides, or one side? Both sides. Of course, we want symmetry. Once again, part of the plastic surgeon, the last thing on the rank, we, we, the last, last part of the motto is we want to make it look good. So even though we want to functionally allow the kid to breathe better, we still want the kid to look, look symmetric. So, oh, goodness. And this is the kid laying, laying on their back and breathing and happy and playing like normal. Now, how far did you end up moving the jaw? Good question. So, I tend to move the jaw at least 2.5 centimeters, so 25 millimeters, right? Some of my colleagues, they move it further, close to 3. Um, my, the, yes, yes, and you brought the jaw out an inch. exactly. Now, how long did that take to do that? So it takes about two weeks to get the jaw out because we actually turn them every eight hours. So every eight hours, that device has <laughs> has a wrench that sort of fits into it, and you just give it a three sixty degree turn. Now the two flags on there. One goes to one side and no. one goes to the other side. So if you see the look at the bottom left picture, you see there's a, there's a cut here, right? You okay. see the right? And so I'll show you on this. This is the cut. So this device, one of so one of the foot plates, that's what we refer to them as. The foot plates. We put one of these foot plates in front of this line and the one and one behind, so that we can distract. And that gap, apart. and they move apart. Exactly. And does the bone grow then? The bone grows, exactly. So this technique uh, was first uh, uh, described, I think, by a Russian uh, uh, a surgeon by the name of Lizarov, right? I used to have Lizarov. Right. You used to have the, li yeah. the frame is named after him. So what he used to do with difficult orthopedic wounds that lack bone that he could not close. He would simply just shorten the leg and over time yeah. distract it. And if you distract at a slow enough rate, it makes bone b between the gap. Yeah, the, the first week or first so many yeah, days, you, you pull it together to get the bone to make soft bone. Exactly. You go an inch a month to pull the bone apart. Yeah. Well, for, for adults, yes. Yeah, yeah, you go a little, a little slow, slower. But for kids, Kids have an amazing ability to, to heal. So on kids, we tend to, I mean, we don't even wait a month. We normally, I normally wait 24 hours. After 24 hours, I start moving them. Yeah. Yes. And, and the device stays in for about three months. And after three months, I go back and I take out the device. And they have solid bone. Most times the kids, uh, uh, no, no, the kids are not bothered by it. If you notice, that's the beauty about kids. Most kids, all they want to do is to be left alone so that they can go play, right? Um, uh, so most times the kids are not bothered, not at all. So so long as they are pain-free, and most times Tylenol, Motrin, and, and typically they need pain medications once you, once you go past maybe, a centimeter once you're really tugging. 
then it gets it, it can get a little bit uncomfortable. But by and large, they and we only doing this for two weeks. So after two weeks, we are done, and the kid is. I mean, the kid is good to go. Yes, sir. You say you break the jaw. Yes, sir. How do you break the jaw? Very good. We take a saw. Literally, we take a saw and we cut the bone. Especially, we cut the bone where we want to, where we want to, to cut it to allow us to, to move the jaw in the manner that we want. Do you pull the bone together then? To yes, first for 24 hours. For and 24 then, hours. Correct. And then you have the soft bone and you just start pulling that. Correct. That's the same thing that yeah. you did with her. Yes. So... On kids, we I do do some extremity trauma. This is a kid that was helping around the house, and a saw blade took off most of the thumb. And the surprising thing is, when the, when the kid arrived, the thumb, even though it looks pretty mangled, and if you look here, this is the joint, right? So if you look at the thumb, the first bone or the proximal failing is, is pretty much missing. But everything else was alive. Once again, being a kid is, is, is pretty, pretty awesome, I, I think. They have an amazing ability to withstand trauma. So what we had to do was get, replace what was missing. So we were missing bone. And if you look at the, the picture before, we were missing healthy skin. So we went and got bone from the hip. And replace the bone that was missing and then to replace the skin we sutured his thumb to his stomach for close to two weeks uh, let me see uh, sorry and then this is what he looks like once we detach the thumb uh, from the belly now the pin stayed in for another four weeks and we took off the pins Again, the kid was like able to use the thumb. Correct. To get skin, because, because if you notice from the first picture, this skin right here, we needed skin because this was, non was not non viable. Correct. Correct. So once we had the bone in place, we had no skin to. To, right. So we had to go get skin from someplace else. Rather than removing it from elsewhere, you simply sutured. Yes, we yes. Right. And and the reason you do that is you want to make sure that blood supply from where the good skin is is able to supply the thumb and I give it time to heal. Okay? And then of course Another kid trying to help out with yard work, cut the finger. And if you can notice, all the, the index long and ring finger are in the natural flex position. The small finger isn't, which is a sign that that tendon has been destroyed. So we went in, and in fact, the kid did have a tendon injury. We repaired it. You can see how the finger now lines up with, with the rest. And the part that we make it look good, right? So the aesthetic part of, or cosmetic part of what I do, really what I want to talk to anyone that is thinking about or thinking about having cosmetic surgery is just safe ways to go about it, right? They, if, you, if you do your homework appropriately, you would get, by and large, will get a good result. So everyone wants to go from the left to the right. Right? So how do we get from the left to the right? First, got to understand what is it you want. Right? So you have to be willing to know the good, the bad, and the ugly. Not just the good. Don't focus on the good. And most times you should probably focus on the bad because if you can tolerate the bad, then you're prepared to embrace the good. Right? Man? So you, the saying that, you, you, what is it? Pray for the worst and hope for the best, something to that effect. So understand what the cost structure is, and of course, you've got to have realistic expectations. 
So what are some good hints? You got to know who your provider is. It says, do you have any experience with plastic surgery? No, I prefer metal surgery. The knife don't crack as easy. <laughs> so you have to know who your provider is and, and get some background as to what your provider really, really uh, do or does. And that is extremely important because it can, it can have direct implications on, on, on your safety or patient safety, right? You will not come to me to get your knees done. I'm board certified in a lot of things, but you won't come to me to get your knees done. That would not make for a good, good outcome, but I can guarantee you that. So, and you got to understand if your provider is board certified, what are they board certified in? And, and you can check if whatever board they're certified in is a legitimate board. And you can go to the American Board of, Medi of Medical Specialists, and, and they have all the board certifications there. And you, can, and, and you can actually check and do that. Knowing your provider is important because this is a survey, actually it's a published, uh, published information in the, uh, the Journal of Plastics and Reconstructive Surgery that surveyed physicians nationwide. And they were trying to get an idea how many physicians were practicing outside the scope of their expertise, right? So the, there are a lot of people out there that do cosmetic work. Not only plastic surgeons are trained to do cosmetic work. There are other people that do cosmetic work. An ear, nose, and throat surgeon that does open rhinoplasty is more than capable of doing good work, and that is cosmetic. So there are people that do cosmetic work that can do good work. We just have to know what their scope is and, and, and truly what they do. So if you look at this chart, if you look at... There, was, there were a lot of physicians, look at 100%, a lot of physicians that were practicing out of their scope, and they were practicing cosmetic medicine, right? Yes, they were practicing cosmetic medicine, which is why it is important to know who your provider is, right? So uh, I, I think that the most important thing about aesthetic surgery is just being able to do your homework and know who your provider is. And I'm going to leave you with this quote, which I think is, once again, Navy SEAL. I started by saying that lately I've had this thing about reading about the SEALs and, 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 and what they do and what they, they're all about. It says that under pressure, you don't rise to the occasion. You sink to the level of your training. That's why we train so hard. And, I, and when I read that quote, I said, <laughs> That is so true, man, because when things don't go right, and, and things don't always go right, I would love for things to always go right in my hands, and they don't. But when they don't, I, 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 I hope, I, I, I'm, I'm fairly comfort, confident that I have the skill set to work through, through the murky waters. And you want to hope that whoever you use as your provider, whether what are you doing? Knee surgery, you're doing cosmetic work, you're, you're getting your tonsils, I mean, taking out. You want to make sure that when thing goes wrong, that physician or that individual is going to be the one at your bedside trying to figure things out rather than saying, I have to send you someplace else. And that's it. Thank you. Questions? Well, thank you.